Yama Bawa, Yama Dagan, and Yama Malia. That is, hello sister, hello brother, and hello friend. Um, I'm Melissa Stannard. I'm a Yuwalare, Gamilare, Kawama, and Nyemba artist, currently living in Sunshine Coast in Numandi. I'm a narrative storyteller. I'm a narrative artist. I don't stick to one particular medium. It's whatever helps me tell a story. So I work across many mediums for photography, poetry, textile, welding, you name it, I do it. If it helps to tell the story, then I will utilize it. Um, this exhibition is a culmination of a lot of years of passion and research. Um, my lived experience, um, as a past the parcel child, um, not really belonging to anyone. Um, my brother kind of had a, a similar experience, except his life was far more documented. He was in and out of institutions and homes, and um, whereas nothing much was recorded about me. Um, the reason I wanted to do this project is to show um, how we can trace the threads and fragments of remembering of family, you know, to find parts of ourselves um, in the archives, putting passed down stories with actual documented um, information, but also with memories. You know, I have all these strange memories of things and I'm like, can that be real? Can that be right? And then finding them actually echoed in documents has been really powerful for me. Like, that's where that's come from. That's what that feeling is. Um, yeah, so this is Fragments of Remembering. So Fragments of Remembering. It's, it's a collation of remembered thoughts, documented information, um, and handed down stories. A lot of the women in my family, my matrilineal line, um, are very strong and powerful women. Um, none of them got to live terribly long. Um, so my mum here and a photo holding me is layered over my great, great, great grandma, Nellie. Nellie Coleman, Nellie Gordon, Nellie Why, Nellie McIntosh, um, Nellie Nolan. She, well, I call her Tricky Nellie. She was an amazing woman, a very strong woman who survived a lot of things and was moved around a lot. But documented by um, Birdsell and Tyndale um, in the Tyndale reports. There are photos of her being measured. Um, and this is where this is, image has come from. This is her in her possum skin cloak, um, looking like a very wise woman. And then my grandma, another Nellie, Nellie Coleman, so who became Nellie Matheson. And this is my mum with her on the beach. And the branch that actually came with this photo outside my granddad's house kind of comes down through when it's, it's like a, a root, you know? It's a fragment, it's a break. So when we look at this image and the, the layers of generation, so grandma with mum, mum with me, great, great grandma, and there's a fracture through the photo. But it's also, is it a crack or is it roots? So you follow that and you see little pieces missing. But from it, it's actually sort of roots and branching out and it's, it's a um, fringe penny tree that's going to actually bloom. So from all this challenge and darkness, these strong women have led new lines of strong women and strong family. And from there, it's going to bloom and flower. Threads of memory. So um, this isn't loose, uh, unfinished. It's, it's hanging there. For me, I like shadow play a lot. Um, it's kind of those untold stories. I like movement, the fact that this flows and moves. Um, as I was saying before, like having the shadow, if you can see behind here, the shadow um, that shows it's like a film roll. It makes you think of nostalgia, like those, you know, processing film. We don't do that anymore, but well, most people don't. And the little girl lost. 
an auntie with this most challenged look on her face, looking, she's all dolled up, she looks absolutely gorgeous. You know, she looks so pretty and sweet and she's got her best clothes on and a little handbag. Her face is so, it's, it's the epitome of fear. You can see trauma there already. Um, as I'm doing the sanotype, I'm sometimes reacting differently with things. So I'll put, um, I'll alter the pH as I'm rinsing it so that it, it changes. And the fact that it's looser it kind of protects identity mm -hmm. so that then this is the personal, but it's also the universal. How many Aboriginal people in particular, but how many people can look at this and think, oh, I kind of relate to that little lost girl or feeling that lost child within, you know? I don't want it to be too didactic. I want people to feel into the stories and feel into the pieces and, and kind of trigger their own thoughts and their own narratives um, you know, hopefully get people archiving, you know, your own personal archive, go talk to your family, go ask them questions. Um, at uni in Kaya, uh, Contemporary Australian Indigenous Art, that was run by um, Bianca Beetson, now run by Dr. Carol McGregor. So Dr. Bianca Beetson's moved on to um, the Indigenous Research Unit and Dr. Carol McGregor is now the director of Kaya. In Kaya, there's always that search for story, that search for, you know, you meet someone, it's like, hey, okay, who, what mob are you? Okay, what are your family names? It's instantly trying to connect and put the pieces together because there's so much missing, you know? We were dispersed from, oh, gosh, you know, if this were um, the New South Wales Queensland border and this was Angledul, say, here, and Gadoogas over here and Kanamala and Derinbandi and Thargaminda, then you come down, you've got Walgett and Brewarana and Burke and Byrock. All these people are spread and dispersed to Warrabinda, to Sherberg, Warrabinda, Palm Island. Some were sent to Thursday Island. I was going back through my photos that I took while researching in the archives and photos I took of documents where they're not in this work yet because I don't know how to treat them. I don't know how to respect them and I don't know the story that's gonna come, but it's bubbling away. So looking back at it again this morning and seeing the lists, you know, um, the document, full bloods under the control, uh, children under and over the age of 12 years under the control of Warrabinda Aboriginal Settlement. And the fact that it's a divided notebook this side is over 12 years, this side is under five years. And there's all these ticks and crosses and blue and red pen and names absconded, removed, sent to Palm Island, sent to here, sent to Thursday Island, sent that scattering of family, scattering of, of memory, scattering of people. How do you put all those pieces back together? You know, this piece here, removed. There are pieces as we walk through that have um, family photos, old Polaroids and, and other photos that I've been able to access, um, well, that have survived the years of being in, you know, floods and other people's care. Um, and they're transferred, so image transfer onto old hankies and it's always household linen because they carry those, it's already got its history and embedded memories and stories and I'm just adding mine to it. So there's images. But this one is actually just the blank space in the album where some of the photos are missing. And it's got the little photo tabs that were used in the old days in the corners. And I've stitched the word in red removed because sometimes we're looking for family. Like you might be looking in the archives and you come with this intent that, okay, I'm gonna follow the hill line for me. That was part of this project. I wanna follow the hill line because I know they're Kanamala, um, Thargaminda, through Sherberg, but in particular, Warrabinda, Foleyvale, Springshaw and Duringa. Um, so up near Rockhampton. Yeah, you can't always find what you're looking for. You might set out with an intention and do you deal with the disappointment of, you know, how do you deal with that disappointment of not finding? You know, there's no guarantee you're gonna find your family name. Um, but you can still work with that you can still process that, you know, okay, I haven't found, I, I'm really lucky um, in a lot of ways. There's 
a lot of documentation of my family history through, um, you know, Birdsell and Tyndale and all those reports, um, even the challenging ones, you know, Davenports. My family are listed. Um, there are photographs, but for a lot of people, there aren't. Or, you know, if you're adopted, you know, or fostered out, how do you find those pieces and how do you find that sense of belonging? So sometimes it's working with that. So the fact that it shows part of an album where roughly Polaroid size with the, the empty corner tabs showing that there's no photo in there. You know, this is for all the stolen generation, all the removed, you know. Uh, so this is the kangaroo bones and then the, um, the lace collar. Now that lace is handmade. Every little nuance, every little tiny piece in there is hand stitched. Mm -hmm. And that was donated to me from a really amazing lady um, who runs a news agent um, up on the Sunshine Coast who understands my story and understands um, childhood trauma and childhood abuse. And she wanted these pieces to be utilized and said, I know that you'll use them well. Mm -hmm. um, so as I'm telling my story, it helped me realize that I'm telling lots of people's story. Um, so you have that perfect little sort of colonial white lace collar, you know, dressing children up and trying to make them into something that they're not instead of letting them be children. And that's where the, the bones come in, the kangaroo bones. It's kind of the, the native and the traditional you know, First Nations versus Colonial. Um, and the old embroidery hoop. The poem at the back, Threads of Remembering on the two big wooden spindles. Um, threads of Remembering, Family and Fragmented Identity, Unraveling. So you read the poem that's been hand stitched all the way through and every stitch, every thread, every needle that's been used in this and every bit of textile is all collected. So all found, collected, discarded um, from op shops and tips and all sorts of things. Um, nothing new, not even the needles were new. So some of them had rust on the tips. I think that one you can see a little bit of rust. So every time it goes through, you try and poke it through, it kind of grates and sticks a little. And that was part of the challenge. And that was kind of working through those stories. Um, you know, intergenerational trauma lingers in our blood, in our bones, echoes through space and time. And then the needles just laying there ready for someone to pick up the story. And the other spindle's empty. It's got all this ribbon on it, all this bias binding ready for someone else to add their story. Because the story's not finished. And it's not mine alone to tell. Um, and it gets people thinking, hopefully, about what their story is and their family stories. Um, reaching out through time, quite often there'll be pieces um, a lot of my work will have hands. Um, so traditionally for me, the, the doll hand is normally myself because I was treated like a little doll. You know, there are images of me, you know, in this pretty little white dress holding it out, you know, in my ballet shoes, you know, looking really forced smile and holding a doll that's dressed exactly like me and my haircut is cut to match this doll. Um, so the doll hand's normally me, and then any porcelain hand or the hand that's above is always my mum. So that's my mum reaching out through time. And I look at that and I think that's my story. That's mum and I, I'm reaching out, I miss her so much. I, I've missed having someone who believes in me, who backs me, who's safe, I can always rely on, I can always turn to. There hasn't been that in my life. I've had so many different places that I've been and dropped it, you know. It hasn't been a case of, oh, you're going to go live here in six months' time. It's you're dropped on the doorstep with three bags of belongings and you turn around and the person's gone, you know, and suddenly you're living there. Um, but when I work on this one, this one for me is, it's the little pony horseshoe, rusted horseshoe. So it's little, it's tiny. So again, it's that childhood innocence. It's the sweetness, it's the tenderness, but it's the stolen generation. You know, the hand on the bottom is the hand of the person that's here, that's reaching out, trying to make those connections with ancestors. Like, where are you? When I was removed, when they changed my name, you know. And then the picture, the vintage picture hook at the back, that is kind of 
for me is like the church theme as well. And again, it's that colonial, everything has to be perfect and hanging straight on the wall. And because the church was behind, or different churches um, and religion was behind a lot of these removals and taking children away and changing names. Um, and then again, the really, really delicate, delicate crocheted lace there, um, an old little doily that's hundreds of years old that, again, it, was it around at the time that these things were happening, where people were having pretty little doilies and the nice cup of tea so they don't stain things, but not thinking about the stains that are embedded in the families that are indentured on their, you know, on their property. The psychological trauma that was done to so many people was just horrendous. Um, the bone poems, I write with a very, very fine pen so I can get really, really tiny. It makes you look closer. And that's what I like about a lot of this work is I want people to look closer. I want people to, to notice. Maybe they'll look at the cabinet and go, oh yeah, they're pretty, they're interesting. But look closer and see what else is there. See what else is embedded in there. What's hidden? What are the little secret bits? I write my poetry on there. A lot of times it'll be in language sometimes. It's kind of the, one of the first ways I, I started publicly presenting my poetry. I have books and books of it. I actually found one yesterday and I thought, I might break, no, I'm not ready to share that yet. There's some really challenging periods there. So not feeling very smart, not feeling very academic, not feeling very clever or like I have a voice or a reason to use my voice or that anyone would listen. I wrote on kangaroo bones because then no one would really study them. They'd just sort of look and go, oh, there's something. Oh, yeah, they're bones. They look kind of interesting. But to my surprise, people actually wanted to know what was written on there. And um, the first ones I did that were at Noosa Regional Gallery, when I read them out, people were intrigued and moved. And that kind of threw me. It's like, you actually want to know these stories? Okay. It's something I do naturally now to kind of unwind. It's just a way of getting out what I need that maybe I find a little challenging, that maybe I'm not making a big artwork about it yet. It might start as a bone poem. That first cabinet is kind of cultural trauma and personal and intergenerational stories. This is very personal. This is domestic violence. Um, my lived experience with domestic violence, but it started with the loss of my mum. I was two years old when mum was murdered. Uh, there's an article in the Courier Mail in 1978, and that was the first. I'd been told stories, I knew a lot. Um, but yeah, that understanding and unraveling that, why do I not have a mother? What happened? How did this all go so wrong? And then every home I was passed to or dropped at or dumped at with garbage bags of belongings. Um, went through domestic violence. So trying to understand it um, and then going through my own. This, the, the dry point print, she's whispering, Shh, keep a secret, don't tell. There's a lot of that when it comes to child abuse and domestic violence. Um, this references all of those themes. It's, it's quite a traumatic cabinet, but hopefully aesthetically, it's not confronting and in your face so much. Like I took a lot of care to make sure that even though mum's murder file is here, um, instead of red tape, there's the white tape and it covers, I didn't want anyone to have anything graphic there, but just to show that this was one of the documents that was retrieved through the archives. This is one of the, the most important documents I've come across to help me understand um, some of the stories and some of my memories. The 10 cent piece is actually um, a 10 cent piece that I have saw pierced, a tiny jigsaw puzzle piece out of. Um, you can, for me to do that is a $20,000 fine. For me to mar or mark currency in any way is a $20,000 fine and many years in jail and yet domestic violence, like my father who murdered my mother, um, you can get a few years. You know, you look at what's happening even now. Um, we have a counting project uh, and 
Catherine Grocott, um, an artist down at Jam Factory. I've done a lot of work um, on my jewellery with, with domestic violence, but she's doing this amazing piece where it's a, a necklace and each time she saw pierces out another female figure or another figure and she enamels it and adds it to this necklace. And the necklace for this year you could almost not wear. Um, and yet what happens, people are sent out on parole, little wrap on the fingers, um, wrap on the knuckles. So it talks about that, like, how is it that you can be cop so much of a fine and so much legal force over altering a coin that hardly, no one will pick up off the street. If you see a five cent or 10 cent piece, no one picks them up, people don't care. Notes maybe, gold coin maybe. And yet domestic violence, when you're brutalizing and traumatizing someone, you basically get away with murder. The, this piece here, childhood unraveling. So the house is actually, the house shape comes up a lot in my work. Um, so here, 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 like all through. So this is Munt's metal. Munt's metal is used throughout. Um, it's actually been donated to me uh, from an amazing mentor and uh, metal sculptor, um, Bill Dorman. And he actually used his portion of it in a show recently. But he actually gave me some a few years back and said, this is for you, you're going to do good things with it, I know, because you talk about domestic violence a lot and your work is powerful, but here, this is Munt's metal. This is from the roof of the Goulburn Courthouse. It's over a hundred years old. So Munt's is basically a mixture of all different alloys and metals blended together. It's kind of a hodgepodge. Um, but the fact that it presided over this courthouse for so long and that sense of justice. So that's another one of my little secret bits that I use whenever it's used, even if it's the tiniest bit, I'm talking about justice. Um, then there's a, a vintage sewing spindle, metal sewing spindle, an old bullet. And from there, the red thread unravels with the doll's hand and the doll's hand's emerging from another bullet casing. And that is to explain the effect that domestic violence doesn't just happen in the home to just the one person. It has an ongoing effect and an intergenerational effect. So if I wanted to, I could, wearing that necklace, and unwinding that hand, it would unravel all the way almost to the floor. You know, that's that unraveling of childhood. On the back, there's a little shadow boxer. I saw pierced a little tiny man and he's a, again, quite often there'll be a secret on the back of my works. There's some other little piece for people to notice or to look at. All of the um, soap boxes. The soap boxes all have hidden dictionary definitions on the back. Again, it's not something you're gonna know unless you have the piece or you're able to look at it, but it's there. There's always layers of extra meaning for people to take the time to notice, you know. Um, so that's the unraveling. These ones here, notions of home, the survival medals, these were in um, Toowoomba Contemporary Wearables. Um, this, again, the house shape. Uh, we have two vintage uh, picture hooks, picture rail hooks. They look like houses, and this one's very churchy. It gives you that connotation. That one's a little bit flowery. This one has the bullet casing, and it's actually a little um, army button that was found. Yeah. But if you turn them the other way, and you're wearing them, they become medals. So it's a medal for surviving whatever happened in that home. Um, so that's why that's called Notions of Home Survival Medals. So they speak about three specific places. Um, the torn paper, this is actually handmade paper from excess copies um, or maybe a particular chapter of mum's file that I've pulped. Um, and then added um, weeds to, um, and then made my own paper. And so some of the pieces were fragmentary. And so I then took the time to stitch them back together. So there's that scar. Um, so a lot of times we, we have secrets, skeletons in the closet, things that aren't great that we find out. You'll find things in the archives and you think, oh my gosh, my ancestor did that. Or for a lot of people it might be, oh, you know, such and such came over and was a criminal or, you know, don't be ashamed of those things. Don't be afraid of it. There's so much that used to get swept under the carpet that still does that I think should be embraced. Um, and wear your scars proudly, you know. Um, 
and it says he was opening and shutting his fist. He thought he had broken his hands, and that references um, how Mum died. Um, fat lips still bleed. Fat lips filled with love still bleed when you hit me. So that's a page out of a family album, a particular family album, um, with photos of Mum mostly. There's one of him in there. I get another bone palm, the little tiny celluloid doll looking a little bit lost there, you know. This, this affected, you know, you imagine a little two-year-old, you know, out there looking for your mum, like, why hasn't mum come home? What's going on? The Didiri is really important. Um, the ring with the hand. This hand has gone through the domestic violence. It's gone through all this trauma. And there's actually a little fungi on the end. There's a little growth. And that's taking, you know, the hand connecting back to nature, that didiri, that um, didiri as an Aboriginal practice of, it's a spiritual practice. It's a, an inner deep still listening. So Miriam Rose Ungama Bauman um, coined the phrase um, up in the Daly River. And it's a way that we take ourselves back into nature. You know, it's the way we connect, heal um, and soothe. For every challenging topic that I work on, I always have a didiri practice in between. I have to have that time in nature to look at the fungi, to look at the mycology and the lichen. And Alint has picked up on that brilliantly with this piece here by having um, the cerealium, you know, the, the spore centers, which again is that mother child, you know. These, these little cells have my stories emerging from them. It's getting people to look at and notice and take the time to get out of our heads and sit and notice what's around us and pay attention and to heal. The piece in there has glass fragments and it's a photo of my mum and I. And it's the last photo I have of her and that's just before she was murdered. So you can see how little I was. Um, and the little forex man that's kind of hidden off into the side, that's because for me, the only thing I could think of with my mum was this smell. I smelt it the other night. Um, we have a brewery in town. Mm -hmm. And I've worked out over the years that it's actually the smell of the Forex brewery across the road from where mum was murdered. So it's the smell of warm wheat bix, you know, that um, that's that last place I knew her and remembered her and felt her. And that was my last really visceral memory. But yeah, that's, those little broken bits of glass are basically like the fragments of what I have left of my mum, you know, connection with my mum. So in this really cool magic box, um, which is frosted to protect the documents from UV light, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. And then there's the little on off switch so that you can actually view them. So there's an original map of Warabinda settlement um, mapping out where, you know, the different territories and um, patterns like this are used in my other works with the stitching. Um, that kind of topographical mapping, that mapping of place. Um, it helps me picture where my family, when they were sent there, and, you know, I guess it was the idea of the day to remove people from culture, stop language being used, stop, you know, cultural knowledge being passed down but they still would have been doing it because they're all pretty rebellious and tricky and you know strong and defiant they were you know so okay they would have been fishing there well i look at that and i see the little dots and i think so there would have been reeds where there was there um bungal fern for grinding and making flour was there lamandra by this marshy area that they were weaving their nets with so that's really important to me having this original um mapping document. It's kind of the colonial mapping, but I see the, the, you know, the indigenous mapping in the different places. And I think, okay, so when they were there, what did they feel? Do you, what if they were here and they climbed this little hill? You know, what would they have seen? It just helps me get a feeling, you know, sometimes you're not going to find, as I said before, exact family members. I've been lucky in that I have, but you might be able to find things about the area or about the time. And that gives you a greater understanding. This document here is a little more challenging. This is the one I spoke of earlier. Um, Charles B. Davenport. Um, 
Australian Aborigines and black and white hybrids. Um, so it's open to the section that has Australian mongrels as the heading and my family are listed um, throughout the majority of the document here in particular and then over the next few pages. Um, that anthropological measuring of people and um, scientifically studying as if, you know, the dosicephaly and this, all this cephalic index, you know, was their hair more, uh, head more um, and cranial measurements more dog-like or... Yeah. It helps people, I won't say too much about that, but it helps people to see the language that was used and how people were treated and why there might be some challenges for people to this day. I have a collection of old um, office stamps, duty paid, um, rent due, estimated total rent made in Australia. And these are all stamped over a collage um, of fragments of information found in the archives, documents found in the archives. Um, Lots of discarded things, so discarded bookends and papers, and this is a spine out of a particular book. Things that are, are thrown away a lot. Um, again, it's always using what people would overlook and see as rubbish. Yeah. Um, so they all tell individual stories and have, I don't know if I should risk this. They all have um, dictionary meanings on the back, uh, at least two. So there's always little hidden dictionary meanings. There's little secrets hidden in each one. Um, this one has the metal ruler in around the inside, a little um, tack nails. This is out of a library, a discarded library book. So anytime there's discarded um, library books or any book elements, it's not that I've gone to a library and ripped them out. They're from things I've rescued out of skip bins um, at uni or different places I've been told about. Um, from tip shops, from op shops, that kind of thing. Books that have been, you know, they're no longer needed. No longer wanted, I should say. Um, so this one had memory jogger. So I've utilised that. This is an old vintage men's handkerchief. It's been rust dyed with different calipers and different measuring devices in the background. It's got the records blue um, dyed in there as well. The old machine calipers and a, an exposed film strip. And on there it's got a dictionary hybrid referencing this article and things that I've been called quite a few of these. Um, hybrid, beginner, crossbred, crossbreed, crossed, half-blood, half-breed, half-cast, heterogeneous, hinny, interbred, mazito, mixed, mongrel, mulatto, mule, octoroon, quadroon. A lot of Aboriginal people, First Nations people, struggle with this labelling and this quantification of, you know, but look at you, you know, you're not black, you're not sitting on the dirt out in, you know, Northern Territory, you're not real Aboriginal. We are. We have eons of ancestry in our veins, in our DNA. Um, and it's more than how we look, yeah? It's a lot more than how we look. It's how connected we are and how much we embrace that connection. Um, so this speaks to a lot of that. Um, the broken doll, um, the word cold, the eco dyed and buried silk. Um, there's all different layers on here. Um, this book, it's a cover page of a book that was awarded to someone that spoke about, the book spoke about race. Um, there's all different layers embedded in here, you know. Brown paper bags, um, elements from different books, discarded sellotape ends, you know, this vintage sewing machine, uh, sewing patterns. Um, there's all sorts of things embedded in here. Um, I have a particular story with it. But again, I don't want to be too didactic. I want people to feel their own. You know, the broken doll kind of sets you off on a path. And this is the top of a beautiful silver teapot. Um, this is a photographic session that I did out um, at a place called Tansy, um, out in the country. And I took uh, this vintage cot, um, antique cot, um, an antique 
single bed that's kind of in three pieces and we and a little pram and took them out into this countryside on this beautiful day it was part blue part stormy and it was just so evocative um, and the dolls and I just went around photographing the dolls as if they're me they're my auntie they're different people that I know and I know their stories um, but most of my the photo montages are me copying it's really simple it's photocopy paste extend expand like and layering lots of layers so this has the doll image um, in the cot out in the open countryside in the middle of nowhere and she looks completely lost is she climbing up to get a better view is she climbing up to escape is she realizing that she's all alone Dara Woolley Wellabar Wallebar. Um, so this has dictionary fragments of displace, displacement, um, to move from its usual place. Displaced persons, refugees who fled from their homelands. Displacement, a moving, an amount of water removed by a ship or the volume of a, of a ship. Disperse, to clear away, to scatter in different directions. Um, dispersal, which was what was done to Aboriginal people in hunting parties that was just called dispersal. So you'd go to church and the pastor and the police chief of town, the little country town, and we'd be like, okay, what are we doing for Sunday afternoon's entertainment after our roast lunch? We're gonna go on a dispersal party, which was a euphemism for shooting and hurting and killing and culling Aboriginal people that were seen like kangaroos. So again, that cross with the kangaroo bones. So this is a photo of me on country in Brewarana and just that beautiful expanse. It was my first time back there and picking up a kangaroo skeleton and kind of, for me, having a little memorial moment with it. And you can see more scattered bones. And that's kind of how it felt, like I was picking up bits of knowledge here and here and I'd step a bit further and there's a bit more knowledge or another bone. Um, so this is ochre from different elements of country. So I've got ochre collected from um, Bayarok, from Bawarana, uh, from Angledul, but also where I am on the Sunshine Coast. And I grind them all up, um, but then I've blended them together. So, and it's kind of representative of the Aboriginal flag, um, the colors. The vintage ruler finishes the shadow box off. You've got the jawbone, and then there's a poem on the side, which is written down here, um, talking about connection to country. So this is uh, an installation. Uh, this is the cot that was used, an antique cot um, that I found. I, whenever I see one, my eyes light up and I'm like, oh, I've got to have that. Um, so this, there's a thing with springs in my work. So the, the certain bed springs remind me of different things in different homes um, and different situations. Mostly not great, but there are little moments of nostalgia that make me feel good. Um, so using this cot uh, and the doll that's hidden over under another installation here, uh, taking them out into different places around the Sunshine Coast and documenting and photographing them. So they're used uh, throughout this installation here. Um, this and this piece here were both part of an eco dye project that's had a lot, it's gone through a lot, as you can see by how sheer and fine it is here. So I eco-dye on country in Brewarana and different places that I camped um, in northwestern New South Wales. So using plant matter, fallen plant matter around so at the end of cooking every meal on a little campfire, I'd use the plant matter and bundle up things and artist books and cloth and kind of cook it on country. But then it needed more and so what I did with these is I bundled them up and buried them. So I buried them on country in different places. Um, so country on the Sunshine Coast, um, Cubby Cubby country. Um, that's where I live now. So it was kind of talking to where I've been and where I've come from and my ancestral land and then also where I am now and getting those traces of place from both um, and bedding together and letting nature, you know, have her effect. So it's eaten away in places, it's thinned right out. Others are really dark and strong still. Um, some have little holes in it, so instead of stitching over them, I've actually highlighted them, highlighted the floors. Um, there's kind of a topographical mapping, that spiritual mapping. Um, 
Wounds so deep etched into the earth speak long, silenced words. Dire, Dea, Warangay. There's all sorts of language embedded in this piece and, and different feelings and stories. Um, if you look closely, sometimes you'll actually see gum leaves and um, you might actually see little seed pods in different patternings. And then the, the piece in here is actually um, more of a topographical mapping, but then I've gone over it with ochres and um, other inks to tell more of a story. So I've stitched through um, kind of my feelings. It's almost like a journal. Um, it's a mapping of place, a mapping of country, a mapping of um, my family movements and where they were, you know, spread and dispersed to. Same thing here. It's, it's so see-through and fine. And then the doll in here. You look at her like this and people just see her as a pretty little doll. Antique vintage doll. And you wouldn't know the rest of her identity. But you flip her the other way and she's a topsy-turvy doll. So this, um, for me, is kind of how I feel. That's why I've got it displayed, where she's both black and white. One's really visible and one's a bit more hidden, you know, under the, the pretty dress. You know, deep down in her blood, in the red dress, um, there's her culture, there's her ancestry. So Yilawidi Maran Yugi, Blue Ancestors Cry. It's a reference um, to the copper sulfate use on my family um, and community members. Um, cyanotype images of family. Um, my granddad, my grandma. They're kind of like little whispers or ghosts and I love the movement, that fluid movement that they have. They're fluttering, they're alive. Their stories are still alive. You know, nothing stagnant. They're having their say in this exhibition too. As I said, this isn't just my story. Um, it's a cultural story, it's a community story, it's an ancestral story. There's strong women used throughout. Um, but yeah, cyanotyped on vintage linen. Um, little ghosts of the past, I guess. Crumpled memories, so a vintage, really fabulous vintage ironing board and iron again from my collection. I have lots of mm -hmm. old things. I could fill this room with the, I could do an installation with just old prams and just old cots. And um, so these are on vintage linen, hankies again. Hankies have, you know, they're spit white on a child's face to get rid of the dirt. They've wiped tears, you know. They maybe had a, a mum's scent on it, a mother's scent, and given to you at school to, to soothe you, to send you off to school. Uh, when you had a cold, dabbed in eucalyptus and tucked in your shirt to, you know, or up your sleeve. But they're crumpled, you know. And even if you try and smooth them out and iron them out, there's still crumples in there, these family memories. So my father's in these ones. Um, and different family members, they tell different stories. Um, all little photographs and, and captures of black and white images and black and white stories on these delicately embroidered little handkerchiefs. This one here, We Sisters Three Bound by Blood and Memory. So, my Aunt Rosalind. Um, my mum and my aunt Sharon. My grandma here, Nellie, with a black-headed python. So when I got my reptile license, it was because the snake I wanted was a black-headed python. And here she is. I've got a photo of me with one wrapped around me and I'm holding it and I'm just so overjoyed. And then finding this photo where she's got exactly the same python, I'm like, wow, there's that connection. You know, she's a strong woman. So this is stitched on a really fine, see-through vintage linen and it's a it's a poem that came to me I have a lot of poetry that's come up I could literally write a book of poems just from this exhibition or things that have come up from this exhibition so this was she returned to the past through the archives 
uncovered bones of belonging and followed threads of remembering to find her way home. Now when you look at it, it's not necessarily visible. You actually sort of have to come up and, and interact with it, uh, which I like. It gets you to come closer and to, to notice and to pay attention. Um, these, the poetry or the, the wording in the background, I sit with discarded books and I tear them with my fingers very, very gently and get tiny little strips of words and then I tear the little words and I sit there and map out the story and sometimes I've got an idea of what the story will be or what it is I want to say or what the piece is about and other times the right words just pop up and it's like yes and I just put them together and it all comes through. So in the background we've got um, ochre from country both around Lake Wyber and from northwestern New South Wales. Um, a little nest not an actual nest, but something that I fashioned into a nest. I have a whole nest series where I made them out of copper, out of rusty things, out of kitchen utensils, and traditional woven nests as well. Um, in the background of the entire image is um, a vintage uh, shooting range target. Um, this is designed the pulley system so that you can actually move it and read through the old um, antique optician's lens. So it says rapid fire, there are holes shot in it with ochre um, coming from it. This is kind of our story, I guess, um, telling our story. Up here it starts with a document from um, the implementation of the Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders Affairs Act of 1965. Um, it would be helpful when supplying advice that you note not just their names, but whether some are full blood or part blood, and in which degree is part blood, and the degree of, if the degree of such is known, to share it. So then there's a little dictionary uh, excerpt with degree on it. Um, this is Taj. Uh, again, all different antique dictionaries and vintage dictionaries that I have, they get discarded you, unbelievably. It's like people don't want to know words or their meanings anymore. So Taj, to cross-examine, to question, to keep in order or under discipline, mm -hmm. to rate or rep reprimand severely. But then that goes down to target and the description of a target and a bullseye and there's eight different descriptions. So much of the teaching was oral, but the youth also learned to read country, to explore the river with their grandmother, family, connections, peace and sunshine, trees and sky, deep contentment, a whole vocabulary of grandfather land. But then, as we get down to here where the center of the target is, the bullseye, now remember the dark side of the picture. There were hunting parties, requisitions of government, children taken, kept prisoner in institutions. And the air was loud with shooting, deliberately taking pot shots with a rifle at young, old, mother and unborn child, great-grandfather, sister, brother, father and daughter, little children, family killed, caught up in the war, the British colony occupations. There's a little girl uh, from uh, a vintage children's book, again, thrown away. Um, so reading through the magnifying lens here with the number two, which was the age that my mum was, or the age that I was when my mum died. Numbers are really important, so uh, you'll find that through most of my work. And it says, there seemed to be no place of rest or safety, she thought, and she's sitting there having a little prayer. Springs, so bed springs, um, and springs from different beds have different meanings and quite often will be hidden or implemented in my work somewhere. Sometimes it's just that they're rust died in, so I know they're there and it's a little secret. But in this bottle, there are actually lead bullets. They're um, old bullet shells and bullet casings. And, from, and the fact that they're lead, they're very, very old. So these were actually found um, out on country by a gentleman who was um, using a metal detector in between panning you know, and looking for treasures, he would find these rusty relics and I always collect them all. So this is a piece that I found. Um, so on there, there's a, a vintage stamp. Um, dictionary meanings of degrade, to humiliate, um, 
to make like an animal, because we're treated like animals, mm -hmm. to make a chemical compound simpler, degradable, degradation, um, becoming like an animal. Uh, then we have repress, to keep down, to control, um, kept under control, repression, taking, the taking of children, um, the act of one who takes, the state of being taken, apprehension, agitation, distress of the mind and uneasiness. Um, and it finishes on that which takes as a sickness and evil. These are little doll shoes that I've made out of sewing patterns. Um, and they have poetry in there. You'll be able to have good manners. Uh, things that were told to me about why I should never climb trees or get dirty or hide the fact that I was black, you know, even though I looked white. It was very much do classical ballet, classical piano, um, enunciation, you know, you had to speak properly and, you know, posture and deportment and all these things, which I'm grateful for, but it didn't allow me to be authentic or to feel good about myself. It doesn't allow for a child to have self-esteem if you take them away from who and how they naturally are instead of acknowledging and loving and supporting them as they are, however they are. You're trying to force them into a little box, into little pigeonholes and make them into something that they're not. Then on the side, there's the vintage timber saw blade um, and the little, the little brush with a um, tape measure, a little sewing tape measure and the doll's hand. It's that sweeping everything under the carpet, but it's also talking about that domestic, you know, use of children to sweep everything up and to, you know, be domestic slaves and indentured servants. Um, yeah, there's a lot in there for people to, to have a look at and to feel. We're looking at, um, so part of this project, um, Again, they're little seeds of thought. There's a lot that's come up through researching in the archives that I haven't created major works about yet because it's still brewing. I need to sit with them for a while. I need to feel into it. I don't want to just make for the sake of making. I have to feel the story. I have to, and sometimes it's, it's challenging. But one of the things that happened was I started to face my past. I actually went back to all of the homes um, that I lived in or was sent to or um, different places I laid my head at, we'll say. Um, and the challenging and conflicting uh, feelings and memories and situations there. This house in particular, um, captured from the back, I'm only sharing the back view, so again, it doesn't traumatize or hurt anybody that stays there now. Um, although when I was documenting and taking photos, the lady next door came and said, what are you doing? And I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And then I explained the project and she went, no, no, that's okay. And she went, hang on. The lady before, the, I heard that bad things happened in that house and I was like, how did you know? And yeah, so um, documenting the houses, blurring out major parts, but zooming in on certain elements. That was my bedroom at the time. Um, so when printing them out, they've got the words, I think she loved me here for a little while at least. You know, and I do, I look at that and I think, hang on, there were moments where maybe she liked me, you know, maybe, maybe I was good enough for her to keep for a little bit longer. I didn't last any longer than this at her house. Um, under here, there's hidden. I like to hide the word sometimes. Um, again, it makes you look a bit closer because you kind of pick up something, but you're not sure. And it says, um, childhood innocence doomed. You know, and behind these breeze blocks um, is a playroom that, like a little, yeah, um, meant to be a toy room. Um, then under rug swept, a child wept. So little elements of poetry embedded over the photos and they kind of allude to different stories but without being too intense or graphic. In here there's a poem. You can barely see it. So it's the edges of, if you look at it, you can see that they're kind of archival, really old, yellowy, um, faded papers. But if you look at it with different eyes, just here, it's like a topographical map. You know, you're seeing the, the swirls of a topographical map, but it's also the swirls of fingerprint, of identity. You know, there's, there's community and cultural identity in the land, but then this is our identity wrapped up in archives as well. So it says, 
Layers of history embedded in skin, what secrets and shadows are held within. Traces of memories, places of the past, ghost of remembering found at last. You know, and that kind of speaks to what you find in the archives. Um, yeah. The gesture of an absent mother, between the emptiness of meaning and the discarded. No certain terms for their unravelling. Unanchored connections, frail and filmy, trodden into the mud and then retrieved. Stories like threads, with the hand working faster or slower than the mind. Traced, stitched in time, uneven, touching, overlapping, gaps, frayed edges. There are no perfect objects or perfect lives. Memory woven of consequential and inconsequential moments, aspirations, disappointments and desires, fragile, weary gestures, longing to be held, to be wanted, the edges of dreams obscured and overwhelmed, vague and quiet notions punctuated with light so blinding the skin is inscribed in pain, reconciled with the stitch and their disdain, gestures and fragments of remembering captured elusive, burnt, branded, with the persistence of stitch thread, embedded time and memory.